We now move to the next uh, session. I'm uh, pleased to invite Dr. Janardhan Ghosh, who is a performing artist, an academic, a theater director, film actor, playwright, performance coach, storyteller, and a lot more. Uh, very, very uh, multifaceted uh, personality. And uh, his research work engages with indigenous practice methods in urban spaces, exploring perspectives of history, spiritual consciousness, intertextual dialogue, and uh, so on. Uh, much of his past work has explored themes of uh, spirituality, myth, etc. And he has completed his doctorate in performance and spirituality from Ramakrishna Mission Vivekananda University. His work with uh, legendary theatre but theater practitioners uh, such as uh, Vladimir uh, Stanowski from Poland, Wolfgang uh, Kolnider from Germany, Anjan Datta in India, Badal Sarkar, we all know uh, very prominent personalities. Uh, he is a teaching and research associate with uh, RKM Vivekananda uh, University and creator director of Oglam and uh, Culture Moms. Uh, so today he will be um, uh, uh, presenting on uh, Katha Koli storytelling, locating the indigenous body of, by performing sensory responses to memory and ever-changing narratives. An interesting uh, presentation. Over to Dr. Ghosh. Om Sthapakaya Chadharmasya Sarvadharma Sarupine Avatar Varishthaya Ram Krishnaya Tenamaha. I thank the Indica team for allowing me to present uh, my paper here. And um, uh, without much ado, I would like to share my presentation. <clears throat> Well, the title of my presentation is Kothakuli Storytelling, Locating the Indigenous Body by Performing the Sensorial Responses to Memory and Ever-Changing Narratives. Now, Kothakuli is a Bengali word, and so it is not the very traditional, rich uh, classical culture that we have in India that is Kathakali dance. So as I was saying that Kothakuli is a Bengali word and it is not uh, the uh, often heard and we all know about Kathakali classical dance. Uh, it, it is formed of two words, Kotha, which means word and Koli, which means bud. So a word is in a form of a bud and through storytelling, we help the bud to bloom. Now in this uh, perspective, we are going to uh, find out that how uh, we can locate this body inside a story and how, what are the responses to our uh, you know, different senses and how memory plays a role and how this uh, you know, changing narratives, which Dr. Padri had mentioned about Misra stories where the narratives are being changing. Uh, so how do we kind of respond to that? Now, words are... Uh, like bodies given to our thoughts, our feelings, and our emotions. So when this particular body meets this physical body, it generates a very magical experience. And that experience can very well be termed in a bowl song. I'll just sing a line of that song. Uh, Amra bhebe korubo ki gaye The moon touches the moon. What are we going to do about it? So this body, when two bodies come together, the experience is so extraordinary that we are unable to express that, what kind of an experience we are having. Similarly, when this story body meets the storyteller's body or the listener's body, the experience is very extraordinary. So with this, I think the premise is constructed that story is basically performative. Like we have heard uh, our, our different speakers, that how there have been different kinds of tellers and they are all associated with stories. So the inherent quality of story is about this, uh, uh, about performance. Now this term performative is, uh, which has been coined by a British philosopher, J.L. Austin, who 
says that there are certain words which itself is an action. The language becomes action and they are known as speech acts. He gives an example that when in a church two people are getting married and when they are asked different questions like uh, whether you accept this bond, do you love him? And the answers, I do. Now this do, this word do is a performative word because it itself is an action. So I feel that, uh, and uh, I think all of us, those who are into this storytelling uh, profession in the world of storytelling or story listening, we all accept that telling or stories are basically performative. And uh, as a uh, uh, scholar says that one uh, Ruth Sawyer, uh, a storyteller, a very renowned storyteller, British storyteller. She's saying that once the stories leave the speaker, they are almost dead. They might be imprinted on papers. They might be kind of engraved on uh, stone uh, plates, but still the story is almost in a dead form or in a dormant form. And it again kind of rises and there is a resurrection when somebody tells the story. So once the uttered word leaves the storyteller, it becomes dead. So this utterance is what gives life to the uh, story. If you look at our ancient Indian culture, it is a majorly oral culture. And we know that how this sonic theology or the sound phenomena plays a very important role in our uh, culture, in our wisdom. And we know how that um, sounds have brought changes and we look uh, forward to changes through sound, uh, how we can kind of elevate from being a human to divine through sound. And that is why even in our breathing, we can hear the sound so hum. As you inhale, you have this sound so, and as you exhale, you have hum. So this, this existent itself is very sonic. We also know that uh, the entire creation comes out of the uh, sound. The uh, Shabda is Brahma. And that Shabda give, generates the multifarious creation that we see around ourselves. So if you look at learning, which uh, uh, Deepaji had uh, very well uh, said that in her uh, talk about listening, that how we learn through listening, Dr. Gauri Dharmapal, she's writing that we learn languages by hearing the Nibhasha of mother tongue, the idiolect of the mother tongue that we hear continuously gives us the knowledge of the mother tongue. And that is how we learn the mother tongue. So this utterance, the speaking, the telling, and the listening, which both are very physical, is a part of our culture of learning and being what we are. If we look at the two greatest uh, you know, bodies of work that had provided us with wisdom and knowledge, they are uh, divided into two groups. That is Shruti and the another is Smriti. Shruti that we have heard and Smriti that we remember. So if you look into the stories, the storytelling art, you will see that it actually deals with hearing and remembering and then telling and again hearing, and then we again remember and we tell. So Shruti and Smriti, if you look at two different actions, instead of the bodies of work, at it goes like our Vedas are the Shrutis and our Itihas Puranas, they are our Smritis. Apart from that, this entire act of hearing and remembering, and then again reproducing is something that we do in our stories. So this is almost a cycle, which uh, we have also kind of heard earlier. And if you look into this great example of Kathasarit Sagar, which has already been mentioned, that it was Shiva who tells the story to Parvati, which is heard by Pushpadanta, who then again tells it to Kanabhuti, and Kanabhuti tells it to Gunadhaya, and Gunadhaya tells it to Raja Satavahana who then kind of propagates the story to the common people. So this cycle of 
hearing and listening, which is a very strongly physical act, which happens in this legendary story of Kathasarit Sagar. And uh, if you look at the other details of Gunadhaya, when he uh, reproduces the story, we uh, uh, find that he is not writing the story in any known language. He is writing the story in a language known as Paishatya. And Paishatya is a language which is mysterious. And uh, often scholars say that it is the language of the Paishatya, which is mentioned in Panini as well as uh, in Mahabharata. But there is a mystery. We are not very sure what kind of a language it is and what was the mode of expression. But we know that it is mentioned that Gunadhya writes with his blood. Now, this is a metaphorical uh, uh, expression of using the body to carry the story and then kind of retell it through the flowing blood. So the blood which stores the story is then kind of carries the story to the next speaker. So he writes it with blood, might be a metaphorical representation of carrying the story in the body. And we also know that what happens to the body which has been kind of cursed, because as we heard earlier also, if you have heard uh, about uh, uh, Kathasarit Sagar, that when uh, uh, Parvati was angry to know that someone else has secretly heard the story, she curses them. Now, how do they get the body back? By listening to the story again. So the kind of transformation of the body by listening to a story shows that the body somewhere affects, or, uh, body is somewhere affected or influenced by the story. If you look at other cycles, if it is Rama, Shiva, Shiva is a great storyteller. Shiva tells the story again to Parvati, which is heard by Kakabhushandi, who tells it to Narada. Narada tells it to Valmiki. Valmiki teaches it to Love and Kush, who again tells it to the protagonist, to Rama. So there is this cycle of telling, listening, telling, listening, which is almost like our existence of birth and death birth and death. We are growing, we are, we are born, we are growing, again we are dying. So this cycle of existence is also uh, a very significant pattern that we find in such kind of immortal stories. Uh, it is the same with Mahabharata. Vyasa tells it to Vaishampayana and then to Sauti who is actually uh, telling it to the Munis, the different Munis. So in this particular paper, what we are going to uh, uh, explore is uh, where are these stories stored? Like, where do we keep these stories? How are they kind of being transferred? Like the cycle of telling and listening. What is the uh, organic uh, process which is involved? And uh, how do we kind of react to the changing narratives, the mistress stories, or even the prakyata stories, or uh, the stories that are utpadita, even kind of concocted or kind of uh, uh, designed. Uh, how do we kind of react to these stories? How to, uh, and definitely in contemporary times, Kathakuli is also looking that how do we engage technology in storytelling? Because, and it is not uh, something that is happening in contemporary times, but technology or different kind of techniques, if we call them, had been a very integral part of storytelling, as we heard about Patuchitro's uh, uh, cowards. Uh, we will talk about that in uh, as we progress with our presentation. So, uh, uh, and uh, I must kind of mention a kind of a disclaimer that this is, uh, Kothakuli is uh, basically a new evolving process. We are still like the, uh, the kind of paper that you heard just before me, is there a lot of scope to kind of uh, uh, look into it, research more about it. Uh, it is not in a full-fledged uh, evolved form, but we are definitely taking things from different indigenous traditional uh, art practices and trying to enrich the Kathakuli form. So we consider this body to be the repos uh, repository of knowledge. And according to Shiva Puran, we have the Sthula body, the Sukshma body, and the Karana body. Sthula Sharir, Sukshma Sharir, and the Karana Sharir. The gross body, 
the subtle body and uh, the um, the causal body now in storytelling this all these three uh, bodies are way uh, kind of used in a very interesting way and if we look at how they are being engaged how these different uh, types of bodies are uh, are engaged in our storytelling we will look we'll find three uh, interesting aspect and that is smriti the seeing aspect of it the listening and the use of body now smriti is um, what is uh, smriti if we look at uh, uh, the definition of smriti it is sanskar jyatam gyanam smriti it is because of our sanskars which evolves when we actually engage smriti or we have through smriti we actually revisit our sanskars and another uh, definition of smriti is uh, gyata which has already been known to you gyata vishaya gyata vishayam smriti so which you have already known that gets kind of uh, uh, reflected in your smriti so it is memory in general if we look at it so you have to have the knowledge and this knowledge is stored in your body and this knowledge comes from anubhava and anubhava you uh, you feel you feel through your sensory organs which is a very carnal aspect of your being so we'll look into this more later and definitely the seeing part of it different sensory organs of out of those five if we look at the two major ones the seeing and listening also plays a very major role now if you look at the uh, ontological or epistemological question of who actually tells the story who is telling the story or who is listening to this story now the answer would be the body after all is all we have because if we think uh, if according to our uh, indian uh, philosophy we can divide ourselves into two beings one is the purusha or the that is there is no vikar in that the the uh, the consciousness and the other one is this body the consciousness the jada now who is basically the speaker is the atman speaker or the uh, or or the body is the speaker now according to sankhya uh, it is said that we have a bhram we have this uh, kind of a false knowledge that it is our atman which is speaking but it is not the atman because of its uh, uh, bhoktritva and uh, bhokta sambandh we think that the atman is speaking but basically it is the the body which is speaking and why this body is in action because of our gyan ichha and through our gyan ichha means basically you want to know the truth and because you want to know the truth you actually have this ichha to do some work that is kriti and because of kriti there is a cheshta you have a cheshta and that cheshta gives rise to our action and that action so in story also that is the format that you have this gyanecha which turns into a kriti and that gives you a rise to a cheshta which again evolves into karma that is karya now where is cheshta lying where is cheshta sheltering according to nyaya cheshta is in our sharira cheshta shreya shariram cheshta is sheltered in our soul now we have understood that it is our body which is storing it it is our body which is generating it now if we look that how this body in the indian tradition is storing and is generating the story uh, i'm just kind of quoting this bhoja's uh, line i'm not reading it out it's already there he says that the poetic expression there is a dramatic expression and the poetic expression the poetic expression is far stronger than the dramatic expression because of its subtlety because it speaks more than what the drama speaks so then you use your boy body in a more poetic way so in the indian traditional 
storytelling methods, we find that the use of body is in a poetic way. It is not in a general uh, um, uh, mundane way of using the body, but in a very codified language. Grotowski, a great uh, theater director, has mentioned about communicating through images, not through words. And this creation of images is what we actually do in our traditional storytelling practices. If in the classical practice, if you look at Bhana, as uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Bharada Pandey, ML Bharada Pandey is talking about Bhana. And when he is uh, describing Bhana, he is saying that Bhana is the Vita who is telling the story, the comedian who is telling the story. But in his storytelling, he is using the uh, at least the three elements of the Natya Shastra, Abhinaya of the Natya Shastra, Vachika, Sharirika, and uh, your uh, Sattvika. The properties and the setup, the Harya is not used much, but his Angika Abhinay is also there. Even uh, uh, Dr. Bhatt is talking about Bhan, the Vita, using his gestures in Angika Abhinay. In Kuttu, which is a uh, the storytelling aspect in Kudiyattam, also we find mudras being used by the performers. In Kathakali, we find that use of hands, use of legs, the toes, the position, the balance. Somebody I found that asked a question that how is rasa generated while telling stories? If you use your mudra, there also you can kind of generate rasa as Nandikeshwara says, that when you move your hands, your eyes follow it. Your, when your eyes are following, uh, when your eyes are there, it is being followed by your thoughts. And where your thoughts are, that is being followed by your feelings. And where your feelings are, there is rasa. Nandikeshwara is talking about that. So through mudras, and uh, as you have also heard about Pandivani, Tijanbai, which was again adopted by one of our greatest theater actors who started doing storytelling. Uh, he, her name is Shaoli Mitra recently passed, wonderful performer. She uses a lot of gestures in her storytelling. So gesticulation is very important. Uh, uh, Shivkumar ji, uh, how many minutes more? I know your presence uh, gives me an indication. So uh, can I just use another two, three minutes? Audio, audio. Another two minutes. Dr. Okay, okay. I will just go a little bit faster because I wanted to show a video of Kathakali performances. So what about body in the virtual space? Now, we heard about Potuchitro, the cowards. We have seen our, uh, you know, those uh, um, uh, those panels that has been pre prepared by Indica where you have these cowards, where another parallel body starts existing with the storyteller. Like the storyteller is having another parallel body in Chitra Kathi also, the scroll or the coward, they are different bodies which are being used by the storyteller. So this particular space, which was earlier in our tradition is now being used in technology as a virtual space. We find it in our uh, internet in projections. We are using the virtual body, which itself has its own existence. And these bodies are augmenting the stories. They are in and in a way, um, uh, helping us to uh, kind of uh, develop the story further. And because these bodies are just not identities, they are actually providing us a connectivity. It acts as an interface. So we can talk more about these transmedia storytelling, where we use media for storytelling, which has been used in our traditional art. Finally, I would like to say, what is the purpose of using this body? Actually, if we consider it a cosmic structure, the story is the cosmic, uh, 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 cosmic whole. And we as a storyteller and story listener are inside the story, immersed in the story. So then how do we use our sensory organs? Is it only through our eyes, physical eyes, or physical uh, body, or physical ears? It is not that. If we hear a Japanese uh, practitioner known as Ziyami, he, she, he says that we don't see only with our eyes, we also see it with our Hridaya, that is our heart, that is Hridaya Chakshu. We can see it all around. So as a storyteller, we need to develop this Hridaya Chakshu through which we can see behind us, side, all the way. 
and also we can hear the sound that is not being uh, uttered, the anah, the sound is also being told. So Kothakuli is basically trying to adopt these, uh, uh, you know, theoretical perspectives and develop a new form of storytelling, which is very much based on Raganuga Bhakti Sadhana, which has been, uh, to, which has been kind of uh, propagated by Rupa Goswami, where you actually enter the story uh, in, to have salvation. And uh, uh, here, as in bhakti, the sadhya and the sadhana are the same. Bhakti is the sadhana, bhakti is the process. Here also, the story is the sadhana and story is the process. And in Raganuga sadhana, you go through this process of anubhava by kind of feeling the story, carnally feeling the story and creating a sanskar in you and then using your smriti to retell the story, to regenerate the story. So there is the process of shravana, listening to the story, repeating of the story, kirtana, and then depicting the story in your body. So in Raganuga sadhana, what we happen is the devotees basically enter the story of Bhagavatam playing different characters. Similarly, as I have been talking about entering the story with your body inside the story. And then ultimately uh, have the Siddha Rupa, that is the purified self, the causal body, you touch that body. So this is what Kathakali is trying to do. And uh, I am just going to show you one minute of uh, a video. It will just take a second. One minute of a video. Uh, one minute of our Kathakali performance, Kathakali performance. I think it was a uh, mesmerizing and fascinating uh, presentation. Uh, you know, like, just like uh, you said that the uh, bhakti is the sadhya and the bhakti is the sadhana, you know, that experience one got in, in, in this very presentation itself. Many, many pramana, pranams to Dr. Janardhan Ghosh. Uh, where were you all these treasures? Where did we miss all of you? Uh, sir, I'm so happy to me, uh, kind of, you know, talk to you also. I was, I was talking to uh, our pro chancellor Maharaj and he was, uh, so he was talking so good about you and he was telling, so I'm hoping to meet you, sir. There are a lot, lot of things that I want to like to learn from you, sir. Yes, you, uh, every paper in this conference is such a gem, but uh, the exuberance of, uh, happiness reach its zenith with your paper, uh, Dr. Ghosh. Oh, God. Uh, we need you. We, we need you very much. You have to be with us uh, with Indic Academy. Uh, this is the kind of work that we are looking for. And our founder, Harikiranji, has uh, asked me to uh, ask uh, all of you people uh, to be promised uh, that whatever you need to take this work forward, uh, Indic Academy promises you to give that. Thank you so much. Uh, please take it forward. Uh, firstly, it will be published in our Indic Today magazine. Uh, and uh, then it will be published as a collected uh, papers volume. Uh, but uh, the level of your work, it should see uh, the entire academic world should know how such a depth of Indic theory, completely immersed in Indic roots, is coming up about uh, this area called uh, storytelling. The world should know. Please, Dr. Ghosh, please don't uh, remain in RKM very alone. 
from rk very it has to uh, reach the entire globe thank, thank you, you sir. very much for coming thank you sir for your encouraging words thank you so much i would definitely be a part of it sir it's my honor to be a part of it thank you so much i think um, dr nagraj garu uh, just summarized uh, the intensity uh, of what many of us would have felt in this presentation